sickle cell anemia. So sickle cell anemia is a mutation of hemoglobin, which is a protein found in red blood cells that's responsible for carrying oxygen. And more specifically, it's a point mutation in the sixth codon of the gene coding for the beta chain of hemoglobin. So basically, what this means is that the sixth amino acid of the beta, ch beta chain of hemoglobin is replaced. So normally it's a glutamic acid, but when you have the mutation, it's replaced by valine. So glutamic acid is a hydrophilic amino acid, meaning that it attracts water, while valine is hydrophobic, meaning that it repels water. So this change from a hydrophilic amino acid to a hydrophobic amino acid causes a change in the structure of hemoglobin. So here's a normal red blood cell. So in the deoxygenated state, meaning that hemoglobin is not bound to oxygen, in this state, the hemoglobin clumps together and aggregates. So this clumping of the hemoglobin causes the red blood cell to take on a sickled shape. So it looks like this. These sickle cells can lead to a number of complications, including hemolysis, which is the destruction of red blood cells, and vaso-occlusive crises. And I'm going to cover both of these in more detail later on. Now, there's certain elements that can, that can increase the sickling of red blood cells. So acidosis, hypothermia, fever, dehydration, and hypoxia or a low oxygen count. And all of these can increase the sickling of red blood cells in a deoxygenated state. Now, if the hemoglobin binds oxygen again, then the sickle cell can return to its normal shape. However, sometimes this transformation doesn't occur and you end up with ISCs or irreversible sickle cells. So how do we get sickle cell anemia? So sickle cell anemia is inherited in an autosomal recessive pattern, meaning that you need both alleles to get the disease. So here we have both mutated alleles, SS, so this is called sickle cell anemia and some also refer to it as sickle cell disease and this is what presents with the hemolysis and vaso-occlusive crises. Here we have one normal allele and one mutated allele. So this is called sickle cell trait. So people with sickle cell trait still have sickled cells, but they usually don't have the symptoms that are seen in sickle cell anemia. So no hemolysis and no vaso-occlusive crises. Um, so you can have one mutated allele and a different type of mutation on the other allele. We call this SC. And you can also have one mutated allele combined with different types of thalassemia. So all of these present with variable clinical symptoms. So here's a little example. We have two parents, both with sickle cell trait. So if they were to have children, they would each have to pass on one allele to their children. So here's, here's all the combinations we can have. They can each pass on an S. One can pass on an A and the other an S. So there's two possible combinations like that. Or both can pass on an A. So what this shows is that if both your parents have sickle cell trait, then you have a 25% chance of getting sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is more common in African Americans. It's found in approximately 1 in 625 African Americans. It's also been shown that sickle cell trait is protective against malaria. So one theory is that the prevalence of sickle cell anemia is higher among African Americans because they come from areas that had, an, that had a high incidence of malaria. So AS was protective for them and it stayed in the gene pool. However, it's important to note that if you have sickle cell anemia, you're actually more susceptible to malaria. So how do we diagnose sickle cell anemia? So we can start with a CBC or a complete blood count and we're going to look for evidence of anemia or a drop in hemoglobin. We can also look for a lab evidence of hemolysis. So you'll see an increase in unconjugated bilirubin, an increase in lactate dehydrogenase and a drop in haptoglobin. You can also look at a smear where the cell is under a microscope and uh, what you would look for would be sickle cells, target cells, and how jolly bodies. So if you have a red blood cell with a nuclear remnant, that nuclear remnant is called a how jolly body. 
and target cells and hal-joli bodies are a sign of splenic dysfunction, which can be seen in people with sickle cell anemia. So here are the tests that you really need to make the diagnosis. So there's hemoglobin electrophoresis, high performance liquid chromatography, and isoelectric focusing. Unfortunately, I don't know a whole lot about these tests myself, so I can't go into much detail about them, but I can show you what we look for. So here are the main types of hemoglobin. There's hemoglobin A, which is the main hemoglobin found in adults. So it's alpha 2 and beta 2. There's hemoglobin A2, which has two alpha chains and two delta chains. Hemoglobin F is fetal hemoglobin. It's found mainly in the fetus and the newborn baby. So it has two alpha chains and two gamma chains. And there's hemoglobin S, which is the hemoglobin seen in patients with sickle cell. And it has uh, two alpha chains and two beta chains. But remember that the beta chains are mutated, so I labeled it beta S. Now in a normal adult, about 95% of your hemoglobin is hemoglobin A. They have 0% hemoglobin S, and they also have a little bit of A2 and F. Now a person with sickle cell trait does have some, some of the mutated beta chains. So they have 40 to 45% hemoglobin S and 55 to 60% hemoglobin A. And they also have a little bit of A2 and F. In a person with sickle cell anemia, they have no normal beta chains. So they have 0% hemoglobin A, and instead they have 80 to 95% hemoglobin S. And they also have a little bit of A2 and F. And hemoglobin F is elevated in people with sickle cell anemia uh, compared to in normal adults. So this diagram is very important. So we're looking at hemoglobin F over here. So remember that's fetal hemoglobin found mainly in the fetus and the newborn baby. So over here we're looking at a newborn baby, and hemoglobin, hemoglobin F is still the dominant hemoglobin, but it's dropping. And at around three to four months, in a normal baby, hemoglobin A is, uh, rises higher than hemoglobin F and becomes the main hemoglobin. But in babies with sickle cell anemia, they don't have any hemoglobin A, and they only have, uh, and their main hemoglobin is hemoglobin S. So instead, at three to four months, hemoglobin S surpasses hemoglobin F, it becomes the main hemoglobin, and that's when you start to see the symptoms of sickle cell anemia.